Welcome to the panel, Algorithm Discrimination and the Impact on Social Mobility of Marginalized Social Groups in Global South. I am Fernanda, Head of Research at Internet Lab, and I will facilitate our meeting today. Our panel will be divided into three rounds of questions. In the first and second round, I will, I will ask two questions for each speaker. In the third round, the participants will be able to ask questions on the chat box. We invite experienced professionals to speak with us today. I believe it will be an important moment to understand how algorithm discrimination impacts the reality of Global South and creates obstacles to social mobility. Before we start, I will remind uh, you that for safety reasons, it's not uh, allowed to record or take screenshots of the session. Unfortunately, we have a little problem and Natalia could not join us today. Now, please, Arthur, Carla, Mona, can you briefly introduce yourself in one minute? I also encourage the participants to introduce themselves on our chat box, name, institution, why you are concerned about algorithm discrimination. Um, I remind everyone that we need to finish the panel punctually, so please be brief in your answers during the panel. We can follow the alphabetical order. Please, Arthur, can you start? You have one minute. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur Guagua. I'm a Zimbabwean um, lawyer, uh, uh, but I'm currently working at Utrecht University in the Netherlands um, in the Ethics Institute, uh, Department of Philosophy. So I'm doing research on the philosophical ethics of you know, technology, mostly looking at socially disruptive technologies, which are being used in the electoral context, autonomous intelligence systems, data capture technologies. And uh, before that, I did extensive research in artificial intelligence governance and uh, especially ethics in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, my interest in this is personal because I'm a citizen of Africa, and uh, we are potentially likely to be impacted negatively uh, by you know, this issue of algor algorithms and artificial intelligence. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, Arthur. Carla, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Carla. I am a software engineer, researcher, and co-founder of Perifa Code. I'm, I was born in a suburb area in Brazil and education has always been very important for my family and after, after being able to enter college I decided that I would help and mentor persevering students who may have the same background as me. This led me to confound Perifa Code that is a community inside Sao Paulo peripheral regions that teach technology and mentor students that want to pursue a career in their first job in IT. I also am a master candidate at the University of Sao Paulo and I have been doing my research work focusing on development of artificial intelligence interpretability tools to help mitigate bias and avoid algorithm discrimination. I'm really excited to be here and discuss more about algorithm discrimination. In Brazil, we have a very specific context, and I believe we have we need to have more discussions that are from uh, outside the US and focusing on the global south and other regions that are not commonly uh, there issues and problems are not commonly discussed and are not equal it one of us live in different contexts with different problems and a different society and politics situation so that's it thanks carla mona please Hi everybody, so my name is Monique. I'm the local advocacy manager at Hamlet, the IF Center for the Advancement of Social Media. I'm leading the communication and the local advocacy work. Uh, we are living in Palestine where there is a complex and the digital rights uh, violations where we are struggling in front of three governments because of the existence of the Israeli occupation government and also the two Palestinian uh, governments because of the division between the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So we have the Palestinian Authority in West Bank and also we have the uh, Hamas de facto government in Gaza Strip. This is from one side and from the other side we have 
all the discriminatory policies uh, for the content moderation from the social media companies. I'm pretty sure that you may hear about the last month updates and attack on the Palestinian digital rights, which I would be happy to cover, to cover today. Thanks, Mona. Now, we now know about our speakers. I have one question for our participants. Using the chat box, can we say in one word, what is in your mind when you think about algorithm discrimination? I really need to see your answers before starting the first half of questions. I'm very curious. Let me know. Are you starting with me? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, hope the answers of participants, but I think Arthur, Carol, and Mona, do you can talk in one word too? What is your mind about algorithm discrimination? Something that always came to my mind when discussing algorithm discrimination is power. For, for many time, I have been thinking about ethics and other topics. Then I started understanding and seeing that actually is a discussion also about how power is distributed and how power works in each, uh, each country and who has th that power exactly. So how big techs and big corporations hold the power of uh, violate some fundamental rights and digital rights of society. And I believe that power comes really strong for me. Good, Carla. Arthur, Mona. Thanks, Fernanda. So when I hear about this topic, I uh, just think about the marginalized people and marginalized community. I'm thinking about the global South and how we are affected from these policies and from these algorithms. So while thinking in, in this, I'm also thinking in how could we make a joint uh, work together to, um, to uh, unite our efforts in uh, advocating for a better digital rights uh, for all people who are living in the global south and also for people who are living around the world because the AI and the algorithms are really affecting and harming um, the way that or our digital rights. Um, I think for me it's about domination and control. Uh, and uh, the impact on especially domination of historically mar marginalized populations in the global south, but also uh, some sub populations within, you know, big cities like European cities and American cities, you know, they are people who are on welfare, uh, social benefits, who may be also impacted. That is in and say when look at the USA, like, you know, the black Americans, who are going through the criminal justice system. So the world in which we are inhabiting of algorithms simply replicate you know, their inequalities that have been there you know, for, for generations. Thanks, Arthur. Thanks, all. Um, our participants bring us interesting words, uh, censorship, Facebook, human rights, injustice, control, oppression, exclusion, bias, and inequality. The need of neutrality, data bias, harm, not explainable. So all these words are important to mention word discrimination now. We will begin the question with Arthur in this round. Each one of you has four minutes to answer the questions. I will let you know if you pass the time. Uh, the first question is, Arthur, uh, you emphasize a lot in your research that part of the African continent has been impacted by the use of artificial intelligence. You mentioned from this that we can think of uncounted, unaccounted, and discounted groups. Can you give us 
examples of how this occurs, please? Yar, I think uh, you are mute. Yes. <laughs> what I'm basically saying is uh, I give credit to some of the research that have been done by my colleagues in India, like, you know, ICT for change, but also tandem. I think when we are looking at unaccounted um, and, you know, the discounted, um, because data, uh, when, you know, technology companies come to Africa, we have to think in terms of, you know, those people who do not have access to technology. So these people, you know, their data is not accounted for because they actually lack access to technology or they uh, don't have the economic means for them to be online. Or, you know, for some reason, they've not really been included in the government databases like, you know, digital identity and, in, you know, biometric uh, you know, data schemes. Then there are those who are unaccounted because they are there, but they are not fully represented in the digital world, uh, maybe due to economic reasons. Then the discounted um, consists of, you know, those, uh, um, the systems, you know, the government and the technology companies have got no interest in these people because, you know, their data uh, doesn't really serve any economic interest. So, you know, data, as we know, is uh, hard to come by and uh, is, uh, it can be very expensive. So some countries actually lack their institutional capacities and, 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 and uh, to harvest the data that is necessary to, uh, for artificial intelligence systems. But I've been seeing, I think, around some African countries like, you know, Kenya, they are beginning to roll out, you know, digital identity and, and uh, schemes. Um, yes, it, that is partly, you know, solving the issue of the unaccounted and the discounted, but it's also presenting a, another problem, which is got, you know, the reductionist approach to identity, whereby it's difficult for people now to, those people to move, uh, to, to move uh, between identities that have been uh, allocated to them by government. So it actually contributes to more oppression and, and what is called, you know, single source of truth, where the government alone has, you know, the right to define who a particular individual actually is. And then I think one of the things that we have been seeing is that the biometric uh, schemes, the digital identity schemes, the data that is actually supposed to, uh, to lead to inclusion is actually leading to uh, exclusion of certain subpopulations. For example, in Kenya, that data is now being used by politicians, you know, to uh, for, for meant uh, divisions in populations to read population patterns so that they can take advantage of, um, uh, uh, say, you know, cultural differences, tribal differences, and then they use that data for election purposes. So yeah, uh, digital identity and bio biometric data schemes are trying to resolve the issue, but I think they are making, you know, the issues, you know, worse in certain circumstances. Thanks, Arthur. Um, very important to, list, to listen to the examples brought up by you. Uh, Mona, the next question is for you. Uh, specifically in Palestine, we can think about the deployment of technologies in a context of attacks that occur in different ways, one of them being through the use of the internet. How have automated decisions contributed to discriminate and subordinate Palestinians? So, as you may know, over the past years, we, we were struggling in front of the social media companies and their content moderation policies because of their, of their use of, because of different reasons. One of them is using the AI and the, the artificial intelligence and moderating the content for Palestinians. If they are if they are using the uh, 
AI, and they are not the only the only party who's who's using the AI, but also the Israeli uh, company, uh, the Israeli government is also using that to silence Palestinians and to censor our voices and silence us. So using such uh, technologies, the AI for censoring people uh, is 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 affecting and impacting the Palestinian uh, discourse, political discourse and Palestinian narrative. For example, over the past month, we have observed and we have documented hundreds of cases where Palestinian content was taken down or where Palestinian accounts were suspended or sometimes deleted from the social media network, the different social media platforms. And that because of different systematic efforts that the Israeli government is using to silence Palestinians and to pressure social media companies to take down and to censor the Palestinians. And we can feel that these content moderation policies are biased because they are not adapting and taking the, the Palestinian context into consideration. For example, the word maritor, which which means the word shahid in Arabic, which means maritor in English, and the word muqawama in Arabic, which means resistance in, in, in English. We used to any post that have one of these two words to be taken down because they are um, defined or automatically any post contain one of these two, two words is being taken down. And we think that this might be included in the AI uh, and the machine learning where this con the content that include this uh, kind of words should be taken down. And we believe that these two words, for example, are suitable for the Palestinian context. And because of that, if social media companies are not adapting and are not, let's say, reviewing their, their um, content moderation policies where they make the machine learning for, for their artificial intelligence uh, technologies, we will continue struggling with their discriminatory policies and we will uh, continue to feel that we are being silenced on these platforms. And this is like these two words are an example of many other cases because also if they are not taken down this, the, the content or if they are not, uh, a, if, or they, if they are not uh, suspending accounts, they are also uh, practicing other kinds of discriminatory policies like shadow banning and geoblocking and so on. And we feel like the, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of policies is affecting the Palestinian narrative and the Palestinian political discourse, with, which is also affecting the movement on the ground. On the other hand, when they, when they are claiming that this, this is like machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence uh, issues, we, we see and we observe that there is a hate speech, racism, and incitement content from the Israeli extremist groups was published on the social media platforms that was inciting against Arabs and Palestinians. And we have observed that this in kind of incitement and content was transformed to a violence in, in the streets against us, against Palestinians in the streets, especially in the mixed cities. So there there is this myth of neutrality when it comes to these uh, to the artificial intelligence and these these um, uh, these policies and because of that we see like this is uh, an unfair policy that it should be reviewed and we have like several recommendations on behalf of that and one of them is adapting uh, the uh, the context and uh, not only dealing with with the machine because it's like dehumanizing the people who are or the users and what we are sharing on the social media platforms. Thanks, Mona. I'll share with us uh, a little about this point. Carla, uh, the, the next question is for you. So in your experience, do you observe from the part of the big techs a hierarchical treatment in relation to the, the demands of the global north and south? Well, I believe that this happens. I feel like countries in the global south are far from being able to catch up with the global north where digital technology companies are the new corporate giants. I see that when something happens in the US, the companies have to be held accountable but when something happens elsewhere, I don't see the same movement happening. This happens for many reasons. 
I believe we have to consider col coloniality here. Uh, we can think of this as the reproduce colonialist mindset and it is amplified by artificial intelligence systems and social media platforms. So I, I brought two cases to illustrate that. Uh, one of the cases that we are dealing in Brazil, trying to handle actually, is that many Brazilians black organizations Instagram accounts are being hacked by uh, extreme right movements. So, and we have been trying to contact Instagram and try to to make no, this not happen because it's happening in the last couple of months. It happens for many different organizations and for some of them more than one one time, and they are having their account hacked and submission and eliminating all the content, posting uh, really extreme right content and racist content as well. So we have been trying to help to, to help for that. Another example I believe it's worth talking about is Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica tested tools for political influence during 2013 Kenyan and 2015 Nigerian elections. And we can see a British company using data obtained from US-based social media platforms able to reach into the lives of people across the world and from Brazil, from uh, African countries as well. And this whole scandal of Cambridge Analytica only started making headlines after the interference was found in the US. And not like you know, when happened in Nigeria. So we see a movement when the, the case came to us and it was a scandal, but we didn't talk much about what happened in other countries. So I believe the colonial theories can be really important to analyze this influence and this hierarchical treatment, as you mentioned, and can help us understand the systems of power that I mentioned before that I want to, I, I really like to I really like to discuss power because they see colonial practice being perpetuated in this case. So I believe we have to create a decolonial field of artificial intelligence and uh, computer science for general that analyze the history and expands our understanding of how to create real responsible and ethical artificial intelligence systems. So I believe we have to consider this kind of theory to create real responsible and ethical AI. And we have been this already emerging. This panel is a really nice effort. All the rights con conference has a lot of good panels uh, talking about this decolonization and talking about the global south, talking about a specific. I, I, I saw, I believe, what's really nice to see panels in Portuguese, panels in English, panels in Spanish. So people, panels in Arab, but people can try to speak for in their own language. And we see commitments to, commitments to fairness and transparency, uh, more considerations about the risk of language models, the global culture and biometric surveillance, and Brazil participating on that as well. So I think we are moving on, but we have to discuss more this kind of difference. Carla, thanks for bringing us your vision and the examples about the work of big tech and the um, different relations of power. Uh, we will now begin the second round of questions. Again, each one of you has four minutes to answer the question. The first question uh, goes to Mona. Mona, um, what are the responsibilities of governments and international organizations in terms of investigating AI when there is discrimination against historically underprivileged social groups? Thanks, Fernanda. So I would make like the recommendations into two parts. I will start with the governments or the third party states, let's say, and then we'll continue to the international civil society. Uh, so with the states, I think states should repeal any law that criminalize or um, unduly restrict Palestinian digital rights and human rights online and offline. They they should online, uh, they should only seek to restrict content uh, 
Paris one to an order by an independent and impartial judicial authority and in accordance with the due process and standards of legality, necessity, and legitimacy. And also, states should refrain from imposing this uh, disproportionate sanctions, whether heavy fines or imprisonment or social media companies given their significant chilling effect on freedom of expression. Also, states should refrain from establishing laws or arrangements that would require the proactive monitoring, filtering, or content, uh, which is both inconsistent with the right to privacy and likely the amount to pre-publication uh, censorship. Also, we think like the go the governments should also uh, put pressure to make sure that the oversight board of the Facebook, which is like the um, the the court of the Facebook, is something uh, really. Um, uh, uh, let's say independence and uh, states should refrain from adopting models of regulation where government agencies rather than judicial authorities become an arbitrary of uh, lawful expression. They should avoid delegating responsibility to companies as a just as a, a, a as uh, any judgment of the content, which imports corporate judgment over human rights values to determine it of the users. And also, sh uh, governments should pressure the social media companies to uh, be much more transparent about their policies, uh, which, uh, which, as, uh, which are being used uh, in the uh, artificial intelligence and in other, uh, and in other, um, uh, in other, uh, like, spaces where they are using artificial intelligence or content moderation policies. So we we have like a high expectations from the government because we believe that they, they should take their responsibilities to make sure that these social media govern, uh, companies are, uh, are working under the international law and the human rights principles. And also countries that respect the international and the human rights law must put pressure on the social media companies to be aligned with with that and also put pressure on other uh, on other uh, governments like for example the israeli government who's using the ai to silence palestinians and to censor our voices so this is like what we are expecting from the governments if we are talking about civil society even internationally or locally we we are talking about first of all raising the people awareness about the ai and how it could discriminate against specific marginalized they also should raise awareness that this kind of discrimination is not against only Palestinians, for example, in our case, but it's also like an intersectional thing that happens also against other marginalized people and our other indigenous people uh, in, in other countries, like, for example, what's happened with Colombia in May and what's happening in other parts of the world, like what's happening in Kashmir and Myanmar and other parts of the world. So raising awareness, for example, is one of the most important things where people People can feel they are closer together and they can struggle together and they they can advocate for their digital rights together on the other hand we we think or, or I think that uh, that civil society should be engaged and work to engage with the uh, international UN bodies and regional organizations like the EU and NATO, African League, uh, League and other parts in order to bring about uh, the, the consequences around the legal framework to protect the human rights threatened by these systematic efforts that violate our, our digital rights. Also to ensure accountability and this maybe it works for the governments and also for the civil society. We should make sure to help the social media companies accountable when they are violating our digital rights because if, if they are not being held accountable then they will continue uh, violating our uh, digital rights even by using the AI uh, the AI uh, technologies or even by other policies that that they are legislating uh, to, to be used in, in their companies and last but not least so civil society locally and internationally should put pressure on the social media companies to modernize
the human rights audit. For example, a couple of months ago, Facebook had announced their human rights policy, but now we are demanding Facebook to uh, make a, um, a human rights audit to make sure that their, their policy is working, that they are not uh, violating our digital rights, not only Palestinians, as I mentioned, but also other people around the world. So this is like the basic thing that I think governments and civil society should demand or should work on uh, to make sure that uh, artificial intelligence is not violating and is not discriminating against marginalized people and indigenous communities. Thanks, Mona. Uh, these points are really important and challenging. Thanks for that. Uh, the next question is for Carla. Carla, uh, about the strategies, uh, strategies adopted by big techs in relation to algorithm discrimination, do you think they are effective in the Brazilian context? Okay, I believe that's actually really hard. I, I can not say uh, I think so. I believe I, I don't think so. I think they are. Uh, we have a dif uh, really different context as many other countries in the global south. In Brazil, we have a big challenge towards giving awareness of algorithmic discrimination to society. So the scenario is radically different for developing countries where digital inequality is huge, leading to absolute technological de dependence. So we don't de develop our own technology here. We import this technology from the US as many other countries and use in our context in expecting uh, similar results. What happens is that this does not work uh, this way and we have really different contexts and we are still, I, I feel like we are just starting the discussion about surveillance, many facial recognition and imaging transparency for algorithms in, for the government and other organizations. For example, we have a lot of Brazilian startups working on fixing face recognition, promising to create fair and ethical face recognition service. So we are, I feel like we are divided. We have black activists and other organizations from the civil society relating that we should banish face recognition and other kinds of technology because there is no strategy that they could adopt that could help this scenario. And there are other sides trying to fix this scenario, trying to create solutions for us that consider that the data is the problem and the big techs don't consider our context. So we should fix the data, create more uh, diverse data sets and many solutions would be better and the algorithm discrimination impact would be minimized or decreased. But I really don't believe that this is going to work like that. I, I, I feel like we have we have to dive deep into this discussion because it's not it's not a, only a data problem and sometimes in the technology field we we tend to simplify the problems and one of the simplification is saying that the, the problem is the data so we are giving more diverse data to algorithms and algorithm discrimination will not be a problem anymore and that's not how this works it's more it's really more complex we have society problems that are going to exist for a long time and artificial intelligence is only automating these inequalities but i am optimistic about the work that activists and researchers actually more specifically black activists and researchers in brazil are doing to fight this kind of thinking this kind of Big techs are going to save us, big techs creates the problem, and big techs are going to create the solution. And we are feeling like, okay, we, we can create our own solutions. We can give ownership to create, we can have ownership to create the solutions we want. And because we are living the problem ourselves. So it's our bodies who are in danger, it's our bodies who are harmed, and we have the right to tell how we want to solve this and not depend on an external uh, solution on big techs deciding that they want to try to solve this problem and not even talking to us or uh, analyzing each context specifically. So that's my opinion. 
Thanks for sharing with us your optimist view <laughs> and the view about Brazilian context. Uh, Arthur, uh, how can the notion of ads contribute to building solutions to the problem of algorithm discrimination? Uh, I think uh, first thing is, I think there's been a debate on moving from principles to practice, you know, to say, you know, we have been focusing on principles, you know, for many, uh, uh, for about, you know, three to four years now. But I think when you look at what happened at Google, when Google set up a, a committee and eth ethics committee, I think that was more, I think, one of their most commendable steps in implementing, uh, moving from principles, you know, to practice. But we all know that it was sort of like a facade uh, because you know the firing of or timid Gebru and those who were bringing in different voices and different views to the issue of you know discriminatory effects of, of algorithms. We know what happened to them. So there isn't really a commitment uh, by big technology companies you know to encompass or to. Uh, to embrace, you know, views, to embrace, you know, diversity, which is actually essential to having, you know, their whole discourse of, you know, ethics being relevant to removing discrimination. I had a situation this morning trying to open a Dash Bank account. You know, the software couldn't even recognize my face. And then we had an, we've got an issue in America at the moment where Texas uh, is trying to ban the teaching of critical race theory. And then in Pakistan, was it in India last week, where India uh, was insisting that Twitter should have a representative within the country to whom you know, the complaints can be directed. So th these are all issues of ethics because ethics as they is currently formulated are very narrow. These are just you know, principles that are Western centric, you know, principles that are coming from Silicon Valley, you know, the same people who are bringing about the problem of, you know, discrimination are trying to fix them. Whereas what we need is actually an intercultural discourse, a discourse of ethics that, that is overarching, that takes into account different cultural perspectives. Um, for, for example, where they we know that I think the, the algorithms are discriminating people of color, but the people of color are not really being represented in, in, this, uh, in these forums. So what we need is philosophical, ethical principles and or normative ethics coming from indigenous populations, from the aborigines or from religious groups, like you know, from Buddhism, uh, from the Baha'i faith, from African religion, because when we look at African tradition or African religion or African cultures, we have got very rich you know, traditions, we've got very rich and uh, philosophical views of life that I think Western companies or the global North technology companies that are importing you know, these technologies can actually learn a lot from us. For example, I think when you look at African moral theory, African normative ethics, that is you know, based on Ubuntu, that I am because of other people. That in order for me to be called a person, I have to identify with others. I have to live in a community. I have to stand in solidarity with others. Those are very, very important attributes you know, that can be in incorporated in the ethics debate. So then the other thing is about data because I spoke about data that is not represent fully representative. What are we doing about data? So what actually needs to be done about data? When you look at article eight of the new EU regulations, which on data provenance, it actually says the people or the tech companies that use data have to know where that data came from. But I believe we, we need, I think, a more comprehensive data ethics framework. It's not just about data provenance, but data provenance should also take into account why certain data was excluded. If say data that is coming from South Africa is just you know, coming say from Santon, which is I think a, a white rich suburb, they should actually inquire as part of corporate, corporate, corporate social responsibility that we are not seeing data from Soweto. We are not seeing data from KwaZulu-Natal. We are not seeing data that is representing black Africans. I think these are questions 
to do with social justice, but I think these are the questions that should also be covered under uh, data pro uh, data provenance, you know, you know uh, uh, provisions. Then finally, um, the issue of um, ethics, ethics as it is at the moment is, is very narrow because I believe ethics you know, should cover the psychological, the social and the political impact of artificial intelligence and algorithms. Because I think by the psychological, this is where we look at issues to do with moral self-determination, cogn cognitive shifts and selfhood and person. The social, we are looking at identity, we are looking at belonging, we are looking at communities. And then the political, that's where you're looking at accountability and other issues. But the ethic discourse as, as it is at the moment is too uh, framed from, framed so much, I think from the Western perspective where we are talking of maybe cosmopolitan rights, but not on issues to do with community issues to do with, I think what really matters to the communities that are being affected by algorithms. Thank you. Arthur, thanks for our complex tie, our discussion with different notions of values and that uh, was great. Uh, we will now start the third round of questions. At this moment, participants sent questions for our speakers. We have some questions. Um, and now the speakers have three minutes for each question. Again, I will let you know if you have the time. The first question is for Arthur. Uh, Arthur, why do you see so little discussion of these issues on the African continent? Sorry, I didn't get that question. The question is, uh, why do, you, do, you, do we see so little discussion of these issues of the Africa continent. Mm, probably, I think you could start with another panelist and then I, I will have to think. Would you like to, to pause it for me? Uh, uh, yeah, why, why do you see so little discussion of this? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's a question of you know, privilege as well. Um, I, I remember uh, many years ago when I started doing research on privacy, the right to privacy. I, I would go around African countries and, and, and uh, I was representing privacy in the national back then, you know, doing a project for them. Most of my African colleagues thought it was irrelevant to Africa. Oh, privacy doesn't really affect us. This issue about Edward Snowden and surveillance, that's an American issue. So I, I think it's about uh, knowledge gap, but knowledge gap is all co also because I think what we call in philosophy, e epistemic you know, oppression where we are given so little information um, or we are given information too late when other continents are already in the game. Because Africa, uh, they are only version of algorithms and, what, and, and, and artificial intelligence at the moment is WhatsApp, is Facebook. So if you were to ask an average African about the effect of artificial intelligence and algorithms, all they know probably is just about WhatsApp. So, so in other words, I think what the Western or the global North is doing is to give us very little information because they know that information data is power. They, they, and then when they do the research or the, they, they give us what they want us to know. So it's actually called a, a, a epistemic you know, oppression whereby we don't really have information. We are not aware. There's lack of awareness about these issues. It's an elitist game, really. I think only a few people uh, like me who are, who are privileged, I think, to be here who are not even representing, truly representing the, the voice of Africans, because I'm in Amsterdam at the moment. That's, uh, but I think this debate, I think Africans need to have information about this system. When artificial intelligence uh, uh, projects or, or, or products go to Africa or the biometrics and digital identity, they should actually have warning signs. Have you ever seen milk in, in a shop or someone is selling meat? They usually put some labels to say, well, this can make you fat. This can make you like this. So that's what we need. So the products that are being exported to Africa do not really have sufficient information. That's why people are not making a lot of noise. By the time we start making a lot of noise about this, our continent would have been colonized once again. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, the next question is for Carla. 
Um, in Latin America and the Global South, a place where other human rights are wrongly violated and recommendations on how to mobilize vulnerable groups around digital rights, which might seem less relevant. I think this has a lot of to do with Arthur said. Uh, in Brazil, we struggle a lot to bring this discussion of privacy and digital rights and algorithm discrimination as well to the whole society, including people that might think this is not relevant, as Arthur mentioned, this happens a lot in Brazil as well. And what we have been trying to do is to speak with organizations who have more contact with people and trying to make this discussion more, how can I say, for everyone, not only for specialists and not only for the ones who speak English and has more access to the articles and discussions that are mainly in English. So many researchers in Brazil are working on that, giving course on digital rights, on privacy, on how to defend ourselves, getting, creating simple things like threads on Twitter, on the social media, circulating uh, WhatsApp media. So in Brazil, we use WhatsApp a lot and a lot of a lot of fake news are spread using WhatsApp. So we can try to use this tool to spread good news, real news, <laughs> true news, and not fake news only. So one way is uh, creating content in Portuguese to share how can you defend yourself on the internet, how to use the internet, how to assure you have privacy, how to read the terms of condition of uh, an application you are using, how to protect yourself during a protest, for example. So we have been trying to create more content in a more more popular platforms, and and Perifaco tries to do this as well and circulate with our families and colleagues this kind of content. But I believe we can use these platforms to help us, but we have to be more careful on which platforms we are using. WhatsApp, I feel that's a good one. That is where my family is. My family is not on. My father is not on Twitter. My father is on WhatsApp and he's reading fake news all day. I hope this can, he can, he's not listening to this because he'll not understand, but, <laughs> but he's reading fake news all day. And I always try to send more content on uh, real news and more privacy news. And he's the guy now who is worried about transparency and open data. And he has a totally different mind and he has never uh, have contact with software or much technology and now he because of my talks and my work that I share with him he is more conscient and asking the right questions I believe we have to make people ask questions when they have enough information they will be able to ask, ask questions about the application they are using their social media and how to protect themselves I believe that's what we can try to do thanks Carla um the next question is for Mona. Um, the Palestinian context on the migration of violence from social media to the streets reminds of the use of the radio on the Rwanda racial price. There is politics in the use of media, but the notion about AI's neutrality makes it difficult to make this risk across. How can we fight against the neutrality notion surround technology well we can never we can never claim that there is a neutrality in uh, in technology because we have never tested that so we can't say like there is this is like the the hypothetical uh, case we did not reach uh, there yet and where we are standing now we are observing and we are experiencing the bias content moderation policies and the uh, unfair uh, unfair uh, use of these technologies. So 
we believe that if there is a, a commitment from the social media companies and uh, the, the technology companies in general with the human rights principles and the international law, it might be or it, it could we could achieve the, the neutrality, but it have never يعني, it have never happened to us as Palestinians. This is from the first side and from the other side, as long as the social media companies are accepting requests from the Israeli government and from other governments who are working systematically to oppress people and to silence people and to censor our, our voices, we will continue to face this kind of discriminatory policies because the machine learning will keep learn how to censor much more and more these voices and such content because reporting this kind of content and taking taking this content down will make this machine learning automatically to take such content and similar content down. And by doing so, and by repeating the, this, the, the process, we, I believe that, it, that the machine learning will by default start taking this content down. If, if social media companies, if tech companies continue dealing with, with, with the governments, especially with the oppressive governments in the same way, then we can't, we can talk about in neutrality. The only case we can talk about in neutrality if social media companies stop immediately from accepting such requests from oppressive government and start implementing their human rights policies and start being much more, much more transparent about their content moderation policies. So this is this is basically uh, the, the case that I believe the social media companies could work uh, and could start maybe uh, go to neutrality in their in their content moderation policies and where we can see justice, digital justice, let's say uh, toward marginalized people and toward global South people and any other indigenous people around the world. Thanks, Mona. Uh, at this moment, I will ask you to say the last words. We can uh, begin with Arthur again. Please, Arthur, one minute. You are mute. <laughs> we need to include people who are being impacted by algorithm and artificial intelligence in the debate, one in knowledge production. And Africa actually needs, um, and, and Asia, parts of Asia as well, and South America to, to be included, not at this elitist level, but right, like I think what's happening in Kenya, like Samasos, you know, for example, you know, they go to their uh, slums where the uh, poor people live and, and try to work with them, you know, to generate data. But I think it shouldn't really be done in a paternalistic way. And we need to see real change in the boards of you know, Google, Facebook, <clears throat> Twitter, and these you know, technology companies. But so far, um, it's bad news when one of the prominent Africans, you know, Timid Gebru, speaks out and then she's fired. I think to me, uh, we still have a, a long way to go in terms of you know, addressing these issues. Thanks, Arthur. Thanks a lot. Carla, please, your last words. I agree with Arthur. We have to include the more impacted and historically marginalized groups in, to, into this discussion. So in Brazil, we have to bring Black people to discuss this. We have to bring Indigenous people, mostly, mainly, to discuss as well and how this technology is uh, affecting their lives and if they want to be part of this because sometimes we, are, we discuss a lot of the data is not diversity and people some groups are not represented but we want we have to ask as well if do they want to be represented in this data in these solutions do we want to be part of this and also we have to discuss more about this supposed neutrality that we discussed some here in this panel because this technology neutrality makes our companies don't feel that they don't have to do anything and wait and like 
the Arthur mentioned Tim Gibril. It was a, a really important moment for me because it made me totally change my mind about can our companies really committed? I was feeling like, okay, they are committed to this. I feel like Tim Gibril, I'm part of the Google Developers Expert Program. And we had some meetings uh, monthly with Tim Gibril team to discuss etiquette. And I was feeling, okay, we are working, we are, and then this happened and the group stopped it. And I felt like, okay, uh, I have to re rechange my mind and work with the organizations based on Brazil to make this to avoid algorithmic discrimination, we have to work inside here to make solutions from here. So that's how I, I want to make you think about that, how you can create solutions inside your country to avoid algorithmic discrimination and give more awareness of this topic with people who are mostly harmed by this. Thanks, Carla. Uh, Mona, your last word. Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, Fernanda, I did, I did not hear the question that you asked me. Ah, just your last words. Uh, we will finish the, the panel. Okay, sorry, but I have internet issues because of that, I did not got this. Uh, so thanks for the RightsCon. This was like a great opportunity to chat with, with, uh, with the Global South people guys, with you guys. Uh, I, I feel like this should be an opportunity to continue working together and also to engage much more people in the Global South who are really affecting by the artificial uh, discrimination uh, to be part of such, uh, of such events and also of such uh, conversation so they can share their ideas and share how they are impacted and affected by such discriminatory policies. So th this is from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. At this moment, uh, fortunately, we need to finish our panel. I really appreciate Arthur, Carla, and Mona. It was a pleasure to meet and listen to you. Thanks to the to participants for listening and ask questions. The theme of your panel is essential to build more inclusive technologies and to question how we can challenge the notion of neutrality in technology. I hope this debate has been useful for you too. Enjoy the right call. See you around.